In Malawi, for example, where I come from, when we did our assessment in 2016 and 2017, for us to restore 4.5 million hectares of, it, of our degraded land, we will need 358 million US dollars. We are a developing country. To be modest, we are poor. Government alone cannot manage to put that money together for us to, destroy, to, to restore our degraded landscapes. We will need the private sector. We will need every other player that can make a contribution to make sure that we achieve um, the landscape that is going to to be able to sustain the people that are living in these countries. We have a very interesting panel that is going to share the experiences with us. But to start off, we are going to hear from Heiko Vanken from BMZ. And what he's going to do is open up the discussion sort of welcoming us and share perspectives on financing from a public donor perception. Welcome, Heiko. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to all of you, that, um, and thank you very much for, for coming on a Sunday morning. Um, I think for those who are coming from abroad, uh, perhaps I have to tell you that forests are really a subject, or is a subject uh, that we are uh, caring much about here in Germany. I think they are, we, have, we have fairy tales here in Germany uh, that are um, in the forests. So forest is something that is really uh, very close to our hearts. Um, and this is a subject uh, that, that, that we are dealing with uh, for a long time. Um, I think forests were the origin of sustainability uh, in Germany, um, but I guess this is uh, very well known to all of you. And as has been mentioned already, um, the restoration of forests needs a lot of money, um, but it has a lot of, of value also at the same time. Forest goods provide as you, you know, an important hidden harvest for rural populations, depending on, uh, on them for their subsistence and income and keeping many people out of extreme poverty. Almost one in six people directly depend on forests for their food and income. One in six people. In developing countries, forests provide about 20% of income for rural households, notably more in many areas. For us, in the Ministry for Development Cooperation, BMZ One World No Hunger Initiative, forests and food security are brought together. For us, the protection and restoration of forests is aimed to supporting SDG 2, namely to end hunger, to achieve food security and improve nutrition, and to promote sustainable agriculture. FLR is a promising concept to this because it pursues two objectives at the same time. Number one, it regains the functions of ecosystems, and secondly, it aims at improving human well-being. This is why BMZ identified FLR as one core pillar in the forest action plan called The World Needs Forests. BMZ's FLR engagement mainly focuses on the African FLR initiative AFR 100. You might know that AFR 100 seeks to restore forests and tree cover on 100 million hectares of land in sub-Saharan Africa by 2030. That's an area almost as large as Egypt. And I'm happy to emphasize that we do this in partnership with NEPAD, the World Bank and WRI, World Resources Institute. But AFR 100 is not a standalone initiative. It's aligned with Bond Challenge and I'm happy to see Horst, who just joined us here, I think he's the father of the Bond Challenge. And both AFR 100 and Bond Challenge contribute to the New York Declaration on Forests. Now that I have introduced the international initiatives, let me also briefly at least describe our own BMZ engagement in figures. Our forest-related commitments, bilateral and multilateral, amount to around 2 billion euros. BMZ supports projects in 40 countries and 20 regions. And BMZ's direct forest engagement is connected with supporting our partners in rural development, agriculture, and food security. Since 2015, this support amounts to one and a half billion euro per year. 
But I will not bore you here with, with too many figures. Um, I think the um, session is very important today because we all know uh, that pressure on forests and trees is, for the time being, increasing uh, a lot. Since 1990, the forest area available to everyone has decreased by a quarter, from 0.8 hectares to 0.6 hectares uh, per, uh, per person. 75% of global deforestation is caused because forests are converted into agricultural land for the production of soy, palm oil, and beef, for example. To counteract this development, a lot more needs to be done, especially when it comes to financing. According to the 2018 progress report of the New York Declaration on Forests, subsidies and investments in sectors driving deforestation, for example, business as usual agriculture, and forestry amounts to 40 times more than investments in protecting forests. On the other hand, FAO and uh, or FAO estimates that up to 50 billion US dollars per year will be needed to meet the global FLR demands or targets. And you mentioned it already, public funding cannot accomplish this uh, on its own. We need the private sector to take responsibility as well. Private companies need to eliminate deforestation from their products and supply chains. This is why supporting responsible private sector engagement is an important field to, of, of action in BMZ's Forest Action Plan. We assist selected partner countries in reforming laws and regulations so that they foster development-oriented investments also from the private sector. At the same time, we support the development of, of sustainable investment approaches. This is why we use public funding, including development finance, strategically to incentivize private investments. Through these considerations, we are confident that we can increase private investments while assuring positive development effects are being maintained, including inter alia social and environmental safeguards. Let me give you, uh, by concluding, the example of the Eco-Business Fund. The Eco-Business Fund uh, is an innovative financing mechanism demonstrating that economic and resource-efficient solutions not only complement, but even enhance each other's success. On behalf of BMZ, the Eco-Business Fund was set up by KFW together with Finance in Motion, and I'm happy that uh, representatives are here amongst us together with the NGO um, Conservation International in 2014. Currently, it covers Latin America. BMZ's first move attracted several public and private investors to join the fund. The fund allows certified companies and cooperatives to adopt sustainable, resource-efficient business practices. Thanks to the support of the fund, 1.2 million hectares of land will be managed sustainably until 2019. In addition, 600 companies are to be promoted and jobs created or maintained. You can see that this promotion of sustainable investments also has clear employment and poverty reduction effects, which are also of high interest, of course, for BMZ, especially in rural areas. And because the fund is such a success for supporting responsible private sector engagement, we think about extending it to sub-Saharan Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, now I'm very much curious to hear more about your inputs and, uh, inputs and thoughts on how the public and private sector can pull together to foster FLR objectives. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion in the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heiko. We look forward to benefiting from your experiences um, in your position that you are operating in at BMZ. And allow me at this point to also thank the German government for what they have done so far contributing to FLR across the globe. Um, yes, it is the bond challenge that we're making a commitment to. It is a call to each one of us, especially from us coming from Africa, where we are always looking to the West for some assistance to deal with our problems. It has been now put upon us to make the initiative to be part of the solution to our problems. And thanks to Host, yes, you have been our champion 
We have done much more because you have really backed us up and thank you for your efforts. We will miss you and will always appreciate um, the help that you have done for us. Our next speaker is Alistair Mo Monument. Alistair is coming from WWF and he's currently overseeing the delivery of 60 projects worldwide. Um, WWF is working towards focus, um, hoting deforestation. It's not a, a small matter to deal with. You have a tough tour ahead of you. The populations are continuing to grow. Our land sizes are not growing at the, to match the demand. Halting deforestation is not going to be um, easy for you. So thank you for taking up that challenge. And as a forester like myself, let's hear from you as to how we can achieve that from the WWF's perspective. Welcome. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you to KFW and BNZ for this opportunity. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned, we're working in WWF uh, to try and halt deforestation, um, but also to protect um, a huge amount of the world's forests and the world's habitats, uh, not just for nature, but also for humanity. Um, and a big part of that now, and increasingly for us, is looking at how we can work to restore landscapes. And we're very much aligned with the Bond Challenge and with AFR 100. So this uh, opportunity to talk at this event is very timely. Has to work. Thank you. So it's a critical area of work for WWF working on FLR. Uh, we have a lot of experience in FLR over two decades, um, working in more than 50 countries. Um, and we really try and support the, the restoration of degraded forests at the landscape level. Um, Landscapes where our work really hits the ground, where we can bring together with other partners, with communities, with governments, uh, with businesses, um, to really try and find solutions that work at the landscape level. And our big objective is to try and work from the, the local level to the, um, to, from the lo local level to the global level, and then we can be able to, as WWF, working at the high level, policy level, we can then also work with our teams on the ground to be able, make, able to make a difference there. We have a re renewed focus on FLR in Africa. We recently uh, became partner with AFR 100, and we have a big initiative there, which I'll talk more about. And we also have a large program uh, in cooperation with other partners, uh, WCS and BirdLife, called Trillion Trees, which is looking to uh, generate more finance for restoration and conservation projects around the world. So as I mentioned, we work at the local level with communities, um, with indigenous peoples, uh, with local governments, we try and bring together uh, governments and businesses to really try and implement the policies that are being uh, made at the high level. Um, and we're involved in a lot of initiatives um, on restoration, um, particularly in Africa, as I mentioned. Um, what we've been learning from those initiatives uh, from our teams on the ground is that uh, we need to work to try and scale uh, the work that we do. Um, we really need to try and work on multi-level partnerships we need to have long-term commitments to the work on restoration on the ground. And we need strong scientific knowledge for the work that we do. And a lot of that depends on the financing that we have in place to be able to do those things. Um, our teams on the ground in Africa are now leading initiatives um, coming back to the international saying, we see forest landscape restoration as a real way that we can make a difference and a real way that we can engage with governments and engage with uh, meeting these big requirements that we need to meet. Um, we have a number of platforms around the world where we engage with the private sector, and that's given us experience about how we can start to generate private funds that can then supplement the public funds that we need to be able to achieve these goals. We have something called New Generation Plantations that works with the private sector on plantation, on plantation implementation. Our Global Forest and Trade Network has been around for 25 years, where we work with companies on trade in the forest sector. And we also have partnerships in particular regions that focus on how we can achieve restoration on the ground. So what we're trying to do with these initiatives is we can try and work with the private sector to try and um, stimulate um, activities and stimulate public funds, and then vice versa, use public funds to stimulate private funds to try and have more impact on the ground. And we know that this hasn't come out very well, but we know that there's, um, uh, there's a, a large amount of money um, available through um, uh, global ODA 
and foundations um, to be able to achieve things on the ground. But really, uh, compared to the, the major global investment pools, um, you can't really see that, the amount of money that we, we're working with at the moment from the public sector is really tiny compared to the amount of private sector funds that are out there. Um, we're, only trying, we're only hitting a very small amount of the available funds um, with working with ODA funds, with working with philanthropy, to be able to really achieve the huge goals that we're trying to achieve with restoration. So we need to find ways to leverage that small amount of money that we're assessing to be able to get bigger impact, uh, to be able to achieve the FLR objectives that we have. Um, one way we're trying to do that is through the Landscape Finance Lab. Uh, there have been some other events that they've had here today, um, which are looking to try and build blended finance deals uh, to get conservation deals at scale, find big solutions to the biggest challenges, and be an incubator for how we can work in landscapes. Um, they're looking to use that amount of seed funding to try and fund feasibility projects, pilot studies, to then scale up the investment um, to really get big implementation at scale. So we can use that small amount of money that we get from um, WWF or from grants or from donors to then leverage a lot more money. And we need to be able to do that to be able to achieve uh, the amount of investment that we need for the big FLR investments that we want to be able to do to achieve those commitments at the bond challenge level. Um, recently, um, there's been a study by the Frankfurt School of Finance commissioned for BMZ and KFW that showed that a major hurdle for being able to get the private sector to invest in FLR is the lack of a feasible um, pipeline of bankable projects. Um, a challenge there has been project lead times, um, finding that uh, development costs are very significant in FLR. And so those lead times and those costs mean that there aren't the kind of projects that we need to be able to get that big investment in place. Uh, a bit like we had in the renewable energy sector about 10 years ago, where there was lots of ideas, um, lots of projects coming out, but they weren't really getting the investment in place. So what a proposal from that work is with from Frankfurt School of Finance is to create a facility to set incentives for those existing funds to be engaged in project development. And then you can use the limited public funds available to then leverage a lot of private funds. Um, and then the objective for that would be to bring the private sector to engage in early stage project development and then achieve local capacity building. So we need to speed up the implementation um, of our work on FLR and try and keep a, a big high level ambition so we can get that big private sector investment and uh, get that really on the ground. We are working with partners, like the Landscape Finance Lab, uh, working with other companies, private companies, and other NGOs to try and incentivize and facilitate the development of these bankable projects. And we have this need to develop um, access to finance and such as a solution like this FLR finance facility could really make project investment um, uh, available to be able to leverage that private money. So we need to work together with the private sector to be able to find avenues to protect and enhance uh, natural capital in ways that are also profitable for investors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair, for that talk. As a private investor, we, from the public sector, as Heiko mentioned, we need to provide an, an enabling environment for the private investment to come in. We have heard that the bigger the degradation, the more the amount of money that will be required for us to restore those degraded lands. That presents a risk to the private sector. The public sector has to enable the, public, the private sector to invest. And the study has come at the right time the FFR, um facility is going to assist, I think, coming from um, where, we were, we, were, we are now, to make sure that we are able to, in, to attract the private sector investment that is required for us to restore landscapes. Before we go further, um, let me call upon the other panelists to come to the front. Um, I will put you back on the spot, Alistair, before we move on, but I will invite you to come to the front. And I also ask the following to join, to join him. Um, I'll call upon Shona Markovic. Shona is coming from the International Woodland Company. 
she's the investment advisor and manager and she's currently overseeing 5.4 billion in sustainability management uh, investment worldwide. Of more interest to me, um, she's currently also overlooking a 150 million US dollar fund that's focusing on area forest value chain investment in Southern Sub-Saharan Africa. Welcome, Shona. Alistair, you can also come to the front. The next panelist that is coming to uh, share with us, his experience is Johannes Schwigler. Johannes is coming from Fair Ventures Worldwide. He's, uh, he's leading a German non-profit development and consultancy organization that is focusing on an FLR. And um, he came across FLR value chains while he was working in Indonesia here. <laughs> and he's since transitioned to do a development um, to the development sector and is now working on making sure that we have businesses that are valuable in FLR. Welcome to the discussion. Our last panelist is Liam, Liam O'Mara. Uh, there will be two Africans in front here, myself and Liam. Liam is uh, coming from Kenya. He was born and raised in Kenya. Um, he's coming from a bamboo trading company. Come and join us, uh, Liam. He's a chief executive there. He understands, as an African like me, that our energy demands in terms of fuel, wood, and charcoal are going to continue to grow. We don't have as much access to electricity as our colleagues have in the West. So how do we balance that? Communities still need to cook. Communities still need to um, get warmth from fire, and this fire comes from wood. And bamboo is an alternative source of fuel wood. So we'll hear from him as to how his company is assisting to deal with that as a challenge. At the same time, um, make economic benefits out of it. Um, I'll start with Alistair to put you on the spot again just after uh, your presentation. What is the key request that WWF would make, for example, to a country like mine or to the German government as represented by BMZ in terms of um, creating an enabling environment for you to invest in? What do you need from us? Do you want us to coordinate the private sector or the private sector can coordinate itself to make sure that you have um, enough support coming from us for you to invest? Thank you. So I think the, um, the issue is the urgency. Um, we have still large-scale deforestation. Um, we have um, major biodiversity loss, um, unprecedented rates, mm -hmm. extinctions. So we really need to get that urgency in place. And, I think we have a big opportunity now with a focus on forest landscape restoration, uh, with a focus on the AFR 100 and the Bond Challenge, to be able to get those commitments that have been made really implemented. And so by working with partners, by working to look to try and generate the interest in these um, opportunities, and to really get commitments um, towards implementation, I think we need to look at a few things, including really looking at resource mobilization plans, working with governments, but how we can get, get the finance in place to be able to get those commitments done. So that means building partnerships, um, maybe with new partners who we've not worked with before. Um, with BMZ and KFW, I think we have a big opportunity on this facility that I mentioned in my presentation, where we can start to look to try and set something up that could really start to then leverage some of those new funds that we haven't been accessing before to make that difference. What you're saying in a nutshell is that we need to think outside the box. Yeah, yeah. We might have been working separately, the public sector by itself, the public, pub, private sector by itself. We need to think outside the box and work to, to find ways of making sure that we consolidate our efforts for us to make uh, progress that is necessary for the environment and both to make economic sense. Um, I'll allow you to pause a little bit and ask Shona to come and share with us um, her perspective on how the private sector can also assist in forest landscape restoration. Welcome. Good morning, and uh, thank you, thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to give a bit of an overview on scaling up private sector uh, involvement in FLR and bring into the context 
uh, Africa, and of course, public cooperation. So just briefly, IWC oversees about $5.4 billion in a global portfolio of forest investments on behalf of private institutional investors. So we come from a perspective of an intermediary between private investment and on the ground implementation. So if we're looking at a strategy of FLR in Africa, for example, we have a good understanding of what investors would be looking for in engaging in such a strategy. So firstly, they want confidence. They want confidence firstly in the strategy and that it's going to assist in meeting their objectives. They want confidence in the manager and they want confidence in the on the ground implementation. Secondly, commercial viability. These are investors. We need to ensure that we are setting up a strategy that is going to be financially viable for them. And thirdly, risk reduction. So we want to ensure that there are risk mitigations in place uh, especially when we're dealing with FLR in Africa, uh, I'm sure you can understand that a number of risks would come to mind with such a strategy. And this is where we see it particularly relevant and where we have seen it be effective to work together with the public sector and kind of work on a co-funding uh, mechanism or various different types of mechanisms where you can indeed have risk mitigation alongside impact creation. And we found that to be extremely effective. And I'll just give you an example of that here with an investment that we oversee on behalf of investors in Uganda, and it's called Global Woods. So Global Woods is over 8,400 hectares of commercial pine and eucalyptus plantations uh, targeting various end markets. It's planted in a mosaic approach, as you can see in the map in the middle here, where the green represents the commercial reforestation elements and the yellow represents protected riparian areas, conservation areas, and traditional community land uses. And this is all FSC certified as well. The CO2 sequestration is certified by gold standard. And what you don't see here is the surrounding area and uh, the population density that we're working with. So within about a five kilometer radius of the forest concession, we have about 50,000 people that are living there. So this is where we've kind of, uh, of course, come from the company perspective of, of risk reduction, but also work together with governments to increase impact and uplift the communities that are surrounding the environment. Because we really believe that to have a long-term sustainable investment, we need to work in harmony with our local stakeholders. So what we've done is we have kind of done a risk assessment. What are, are the biggest threats to the investment? And as well, from, from the government perspective, where can we really generate meaningful impact here? So for this investment, encroachment was a clear uh, concern, working with farmers as well as uh, cattle keepers. So what we did was we utilized uh, a co-funding mechanism together with government, where we set up programs to train farmers, train cattle keepers, and improve their outputs to release the pressure from the financial investment. And we've seen a great impact there and, of course, uh, uplifting the entire area and creating a better all-round forest landscape. And what we plan to do with that is scale that up to a fund. So use Global Woods really as a blueprint for scale, where we're planning to develop a 150 million euro fund. Sorry, we are developing it. And it will target early forest value chain uh, projects across sub-Saharan Africa. So what this means is looking at really establishing new forests. Now, in order to attract private funding to this, we need to remove the barriers to private finance uh, coming into this sector. So this is risk. This is cash flow considerations with the long time horizons of early forest establishment. And where we could really uh, see this happening is through uh, incorporating bl uh, public funding, uh, blending it in like a junior equity uh, right into the fund structure itself, as well as looking at potentially public sponsorship of uh, CO2 sequestration, so off-taking uh, the CO2 that's sequestered from the project and actually funding that. And then as well carrying out the forest landscape uh, restoration approach, which we believe as I mentioned before, uh, reduces risk and creates impact. So bringing on uh, public sponsors to pay for the impacts that will be generated from those activities. 
would really support this strategy and thus FLR happening at scale across sub-Saharan Africa. And then, of course, we would utilize the skills that we've acquired, uh, not just in Global Woods, but across a, a broad spectrum of investments that we've had in forest landscape restoration, uh, utilizing the lessons learned and the achievements that we've made to, to scale this up. So that's it, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Shona. So it's not a question of where, whether we have money or not. Money is there, but let's talk about incentives. The private sector needs incentives to invest. Um, I'll put Alistair back on the spot while Shona is settling down. They, we talk of impact investors in FLR because we're talking about investments that are going to make sustainable impacts, both environmentally and economically. From your point of view, having heard uh, Shona's example from Uganda. Uh, would we rather focus on small scale plantation level or forest restoration or more large scale plantation level? Now, in terms of how do we make the most economic sense, we, if you look at it that way, what would you say? Focusing on more small scale community forest or large scale plantation level? What's your take on that? We need to do both. Um, I think we need to work at the large scale and the small scale to be able to make things work and the situations are different in everywhere we work. So we need to look at every landscape where we're trying to have a difference and look at the different actors who are involved in that landscape uh, and come up with plans that work for that place and that might be large scale in some places, it might be small scale in others. So I think it depends on the particular landscape where you're going to work. Um, that's true. Um, for us, um, in Africa, it even goes beyond whether it's just a question of large scale or small scale. Um, when culture comes in, um, in my country alone, there's one particular landscape where people speak 13 different languages. And these are 300,000 people only. And they speak 13 different languages. So for you to address their challenges, what it means, you need a variety of alternatives that will be Confess, or will be will work well for each one of those people for, for them to invest. So even when you talk about um, making commercial sense out of it, yes, as I was saying, there will be times when we need large scale plantation level investment. There will be times when we will need to restrict ourselves to community level um, plantation forests. Thank you very much. And now to accelerate um, forest landscape restoration. It's not all doom and gloom. We have business, business cases that are working on the ground at the moment. Um, and Liam and Johannes are going to share those examples with us. But to start with, I'll ask Johannes to come and share um, from his perspective on sustainable agroforestry and landscape management, what is happening in Indonesia. Welcome, Johannes. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here to share our experience. I speak about small things, about small scale, not about a big scale. And I speak about an entrepreneurial approach. What you see here is a two-year stand in Indonesia. We work in central Borneo uh, in a wildlife or in a corridor, in a biodiversity corridor between two national parks and mainly working with a species, it's called Albacea, native to Eastern Indonesia. It's a four years tree you see here. So you can harvest after seven years. And, whoops. No, this is not the next. Sorry, this is, it's another sequence. No, 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 this one somehow it changed, I don't know why. Sorry, I have to go further and then I go back, no problem. So it's about food and forest on the same land, this species, and there are many species around which allow to be plant, foods planted between the rows. It's only half shadowing species and it's a leguminose who, who fix nitrogen in the, in the soil. And 
There are many species around who allow that, working on the same crowd with food and um, forests on the same land. And if you come and see the two years, the three years stand, you see it's possible to do forest landscape restoration. And the big question, how do we get that smaller things into scale? Sorry, now I have to go back. The next slide is, ah, sorry for that, but this is, it's this. So we work as Fair Ventures, we are a non-profit limited company based in Germany with activities in Uganda and in Indonesia. So we occupy the decorated landscapes in front of the natural forest, like you see here. And we monitor each and every single tree. And this is extremely important to do the learning and to safeguard our activities. So each and every single tree is counted. And our theory is occupying the the decorated landscapes in order to keep the natural forests alive. This is what you see uh, from May 2016 and this is 17. So within one year we see a huge change. And as said, to prove what we are doing, to organize the learning, um, my one of my messages is invest heavily into digital monitoring tools and uh, be prepared to tell the story. Now I have to go back again, sorry for that. So, it's important to think from the back. Over there you will see some products so we work along the value chain and actually we started at the end of the value chain. We work with the big companies, processing companies, doing glue lamp beams like this. So from the fast growing woods, you can make glue lamp beams, laminated veneer lumber, plywood. So we have to rethink the wood processing. We work with the food companies at the end of the value chain. And if we speak about mobilizing resources, we should not only think about the investors, we should think about selling the products on a later stage. And this brings the pull on the, on the landscape. Really have the end in mind, not only starting at the beginning. So we plant some trees, so think about what is being done. This, this wood in Indonesia, the price is 80 euros at the company gate. In Uganda, the pine is $25 at the moment. In Indonesia, it's 80 euros, and you have 50 cubics per hectare per year on the same landscape. So start with that and make contracts with the companies. So now, sorry for that, this is completely mixed up. This was the... We... As a non-profit limited company, we saw we prepare people to be able and communities to be able to then become an entrepreneur, to be able to invest and, 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 and to manage forests. And we see there, is, there are somehow the, the donors and the investors and the many non-profit organizations preparing forest landscape restoration and there is missing something in between. So there is, it's, it's not fitting together and therefore forest landscape restoration is not happening. So for me, it's, we should not speak about the private sector, we should speak, speak about finding the entrepreneurs who make their hands dirty and to start planting and to look for investors and for looking to, uh, for support. And this is what we have been doing as Fair Ventures Worldwide. We now established a limited company and we look for 4 million euros. And together with the Indonesian government, we have, they have asked us to work together with them on 4,000 hectares. In central Kalimantan, you see the mosaic. So we have degraded landscapes and we have natural forests, so we will work replanting on the degraded landscapes and 
the business case is there. It's the question how to make this possible, the business case possible. So, this was the last slide. So, it was a wrong presentation. I don't know what happened. Um, so, my um, message is that we are lucky we found a first investor for the 4 million uh, euros we are looking for for the 4,000 hectares and we looked at private people because we do not fit yet into the institutional, institutional uh, settings, the institutional investors, we are too far away. And this is my message to the public donors and to the investors. The investors need to take more risk. They have to have uh, an uh, innovation, innovative products, and if not, the medium sized, the smaller, the smaller sized things will not happen. If the investors are not taking more risks or if the donors are not able to be innovative with their inst instruments. So then it will, it, it will not happen. And um, this is actually uh, where we are working on and I would like to share the products and finally I think I stop with that. I, there are some slides have been missing. I don't know. I, maybe I sent the wrong presentation. Well, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Johannes, for sharing that. I will give you another opportunity to say a little bit more. Um, don't worry about the missing slides. It happens. Um, yes, as you mentioned, on your one of on, on one of your um, very beginning slides, food is almost the most common goal in all the, on the majority of these degraded areas. So you have people that are hungry, and of course they are presenting a risk to businesses. But uh, but at the same time, we are presented with an opportunity here for the uh, the business sector, for the private sector, to invest in the degraded landscapes and still make money out of it. Um, before, I, before we move on, let's go back to Shona. Having heard what Johannes has uh, presented, we are talking about the people's needs, how we safeguard their, their needs as well. How do you reconcile commercial objectives with invest, I mean environmental and social objectives um, of FLR? Sorry, I'm just, oh, sorry. it is working. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a very important question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's important, first of all, to consider, and I mean, all of us in the room are well aware of this, that you need to balance all three. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have a sustainable business model, a sustainable environment, a sustainable society, if you're separating those. Mm -hmm. Practically, what we do, uh, Firstly, we turn to forest certification. So we find FSC certification is an excellent uh, management tool. Um, first of all, does it not only make sure that you're upholding uh, economic, environmental, and social objectives, it really creates a culture within the community, or within the company, sorry, uh -huh. where your day-to-day -day operations uh -huh. are structured around considering these objectives. Uh -huh. So from the economic perspective, we are assessed on making sure that uh, the silvicultural regimes are consistent with the growth and yield models, uh, and also that these are relating to the markets that we expect to target, which you talked about with the uh, thinking about the end of the supply chain. Oh. When we're looking at environmental objectives, we also have biodiversity monitoring that we have to do regularly. We have to make sure there are safeguards in place operationally uh, so that we're managing for rare, threatened, and endangered species. Socially, we have to carry out free, prior, and informed consent, meaning that we have a platform to engage with uh, local stakeholders and give them the opportunity to raise concerns and the issues that they might have. So these are just a few examples of what FSC can, can bring in terms of managing those three. Uh, additionally to that, we do the, this forest landscape restoration 
approach, like I was mentioning. Uh, you can't see your commercial investment as something separate from the forest landscape. You have to think about, about the wider area. So again, looking at this from kind of a risk and impact perspective. And then additionally, I would say that cross-sectoral partnerships are very powerful. So this is looking at it, of course, we sit kind of in the economic segment of this triple bottom line, yeah. but by working with local stakeholders and NGOs, uh, research organizations, oh. and as well the public sector, sector oh. this helps us to be oh. accountable yes. to all three objectives. Mm -hmm. And this goes back again to where um, co-funding opportunities with the public sector can really uh, build sustainable forest landscapes oh. that are commercially viable environmentally sustainable and socially accepted. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it is important to work mm -hmm. with all three mm -hmm. and to bring in uh, many stakeholders into the equation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Your answer has been very thorough and I won't say anything more to add to that. I hope it has been clearly um, understood. Let me now ask Liam um, to share with us now coming from Kenya, what are your experience has been and how do we make sure that what Shona has just explained works well with um, the, our, our general FLL objectives? Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, indigenous forestry in Kenya. Let me begin by saying that uh, I represent the Bambi Trading Company, I'm the Managing Director, and uh, for many years we sought finance from uh, a wide range of, of organizations to develop Kenya's indigenous species of bamboo into a commodity, predominantly for energy, and we failed. And after a number of years, I was approached by a private German company, and they asked us to, to, to invest in a public-private partnership with the government of Kenya. Shauna has spoken very eloquently about exotic forestry. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the need to develop value, commercial value, in montane forest and in African woodland, African savanna. Over the last hundred years, Large areas of Africa have been turned into exotic monocultures of foreign species. We've lost our biodiversity, we've lost our water catchment, and we have been encouraged to incorporate a European and Australian and American style of forestry and agriculture. And since UNEP was established in Kenya, uh, we have probably lost in the region of 80% of our wildlife and 80% of our forest. Now, there are a number of reasons for this. We, we need, first and foremost, to, to ensure that the African people make money from forestry. At the moment, large areas of, of wilderness have been used to, to produce beef and sheep and cattle protein for the local economy. And people have cleared, they've burnt, they've destroyed the African wilderness so that they can develop grassland. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about energy. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we can add value to ecosystems that were not planted by man. They did not have fertilizer, they did not have agrochemical, they did not have people pruning them. Um, there was no management, there was no security. I, for a period of time, worked for a company called Agreco, and uh, we produced uh, electricity for 26 countries in Africa using diesel and, in some countries, methane. Now, large amounts of electricity in Kenya are produced from thermal energy. Very expensive and, obviously, very polluting. We also have a number of industries, like the tea industry, which is the largest employer of people in the country, which run exclusively on wood fuel. Until recently, the large multinational corporations grew large areas of eucalyptus. Today, I'm pleased to announce that many of the tea factories grow indigenous bamboo that they hope they will be able to supplement and replace the eucalyptus with. 
Typically, we use 3.1 kilos of wood at 25% moisture to equate with one kilo of heavy fuel oil. Now, the government of Kenya um, has borrowed very heavily over the years from uh, a number of international institutions, but in particular from the Chinese government. And today we are beholden to the nation of China. I want to say that this is a double-edged sword. The Chinese know more about bamboo than virtually anybody else, and we could allow them in to develop bamboo into a major commodity in Kenya and in Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. The Chinese would need to take concessions of indigenous bamboo. They would need to thin those concessions sustainably, maintaining a permanent canopy, and they would need to be able to develop that bamboo into a number of value-added products. Because 65% of Kenya's energy is firewood and charcoal, it makes sense for people like the Chinese to invest in energy. Now, we could save billions of dollars in Kenya, and we wouldn't need to procure oil from Saudi Arabia and Dubai and other countries. That money could go from Treasury straight into uh, large-scale landscape restoration, particularly on our water towers where erosion and um, wholesale uh, um, environmental destruction is evident. And we could provide tens of thousands of small people with employment, sustainable employment. So wood fuel could provide us with water catchment, wood, uh, water habitat, um, wildlife habitat, um, and uh, we could stop a lot of the erosion and the desertification in, in Kenya. Um, I want to say that over the last uh, year or two, Kenya has experienced huge flooding across the country, and a lot of people have turned to climate change, and they've said that um, climate change is largely responsible for the desertification in the country, and for the, for the, the, the large-scale flooding. But without grassland, without woodland, and without forestry, we will continue to see widespread destruction. And unfortunately, um, not enough has been said about growing and, and producing indigenous forest and indigenous woodland. This is Kenya's indigenous bamboo, a species called Arundinari alpina. It grows very straight in, in a natural uh, monoculture, without chemical, without fertilizer. It has the elephant and the buffalo and, and, and the, the bushbuck and the colobus monkeys. And it can be cut and chipped, and it can be fed into industrial boilers, either as chip or as, as, as round bamboo. Um, you'll see the illustration on, on the, the top right-hand corner shows bamboo growing. Typically, we grow one pole and then we, 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 um, we harvest one pole and we leave three poles, and the, the bamboo shoots emerge from, their ground, from the ground their full diameter. So we can produce from this around 50 tons per hectare per year sustainably without using agrochemical and fertilizer. I am very interested in, 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 in woodland now because we have developed our public-private partnership with the government, and um, they have closed the government forests now for two years. So those that invested, that brought European finance or American finance to Kenya to invest in, 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 in the nation's forests, have really struggled to, to see a return on their investment because continuously we are thwarted by corruption and mismanagement in, in government. This photograph here illustrates the relationship that large herbivores once had with Africa. Um, the eastern side of Kenya had over 100,000 elephants as, as early as, well, as, as late as the, the 50s and 60s. And these elephants destroyed vast areas of woodland. We also had the black rhino, which browses. We also had vast herds of buffalo in Eland, which also browse. Today, most of these animals have gone, and in large parts of, of uh, semi-arid Kenya, we now have a lot more woodland than we've ever had before. So in some places where that we are close proximity to, to towns and cities and villages, we have a lot less woodland. In some places, we have a lot more woodland. Um, 
there are a number of species here, like acacia, camifera, um, in some parts, uh, euclea and, and leleshwa, that can be developed into a sustainable cash crop. We may only obtain one ton per hectare per year. But some of these group ranches are privately held, and they're, they're between a million and, 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 and a million uh, acres, and, and some of them, some of them even more. We we need to be able to develop these these group ranches, and we need to be able to develop these farms sustainably. We need to see that the trade in wood fuel provides the rancher or the farmer with substantially more money than he currently makes from cattle, sheep, and goats. And we need to think very seriously about where the nation gets its protein from and, and think very carefully about sustainable hunting. Because there is no more effective, cost-effective way to produce protein than, than by allowing for the, the sustainable um, development of wildlife uh, and, and the replacement of uh, large areas of cattle and sheep and goats. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the ranches are being burnt and destroyed, and millions and millions of tons of, of, of firewood are going up in smoke. Millions of dollars are being exchanged for a few thousand dollars worth of grazing. This has to stop. And the top right-hand corner, you can see one of the, the ranches in Lycipia. One, on one side is a conservancy, beautifully looked after and managed with wildlife. And, and on the left-hand side, you have community land, which is completely overgrazed. And desertification is something that we need to take very seriously. The people of Africa must eat, they must have protein. But we must not allow the livestock to destroy the indigenous wilderness that we have that, that, that remains. Thank you very much. You can tell that it's coming from where the issues are, from the way he has articulated the problems <laughs> that are there on the ground. Thank you very much for sharing that. And just to add a little bit more, uh, you did mention in your slide that wood fuel is the cheapest um, type of fuel that we get in Africa. But um, I'll also say that if you look at it from a woman perspective, it's the most expensive because women are walking longer distances to get this firewood for their homes. And we studies that were done in Malawi two years ago um, ended up saying that women are time poor because if you spend six hours of your day going to collect firewood and then another two hours just to walk about to get water for the household, how much time do you have left for yourself as a person? On top of that, you are the biggest food producer at the household level. So it might be the cheapest in terms of how much it costs, but the cost on the individuals themselves to bring that firewood to be used at their home is, is too high. And yes, Liam, that's why you are, your company is dealing with the real problem here, because we have to find an alternative. If the majority of people have this as a challenge, we need to have an alternative that is going to provide uh, for the needs of the people, and we need wood. Um, to go back to Johannes, um, we have um, a better presentation now for you to share with us. But be, as you are coming um, to do that, you, I will want to ask you, how do you suppose, you talked about us, uh, entrepreneurship in EFLA. Um, how do you suppose we find or we create those entrepreneurs that are suitable for these degraded landscapes from your perspective? So this is a question to all of us in the room. So for the people working in institutions, so why not leaving my comfort zone and becoming an entrepreneur and start with your with own investment or with your own, own planting? Or it's about the entrepreneurs, the, the richer people in, the, in that countries to get engaged in forest landscape restoration. And it's our obligation then finding value chain partners, bringing back then the pull to the forest, uh, yeah, the pull to the, uh, to the landscape. So, and in the countries, so we need to identify mm -hmm. game changers like we did in Indonesia. We have certain key farmers, we have certain uh, people who, who are more the people who can afford, so it's not the very poor, we need the people 
who can afford, who are a bit richer, and to get engaged in forest landscape restoration or in planting, tree planting, mm -hmm. and then helping them to find a market and then to get back the pull to the, mm -hmm. to the field, to the landscape. Mm -hmm. Come on up and um, share a little bit about this, the slides that we're missing. Sorry <laughs> for, the, for this confusion. There are two <laughs> more slides, if possible. Yeah, this is the one slide. So if we are going to speak about afforestation, my, my key message is go to the end of the value chain. You see the President uh, Jokovi on our stand at the Trade Expo in Jakarta. And we work with the Trade Ministry and the, the one and only post of, on his Facebook and on his Instagram account of the fair was this stand. So it's about light wood, it's about the new materials. If we go to the post-carbon economy, we have to replace concrete, we have to replace steel and plastic, mineral-based um, mineral um, things. So, and what is the future? It's the fiber, it's a net natural fiber, and how to do that. Mm -hmm. So this is the pull, and then you have a lot of people Speaking of, about that, you see many big companies, the biggest food processing companies, and with them we go back to the landscape mm. and start replanting with the big companies. This was the one slide. And then, so, this one, yeah, no, no, the one before. So this was what I, what I said. We detected that there is nobody picking up that ideas. It's too far away, there is somebody needed to do that. And we planted only a, a million trees so far with about 1,500 farmers. And we decided to go for the 100 million trees. But there is nobody doing that, so make your hands dirty, go to the field, get engaged with people. And uh, this is what we decided. And therefore, we came up then together with the government. The government asked us to go with um, with two villages, it's, they got the social forestry license, it's about 4,000 hectares, and we calculated the case. It, on the paper, it looks really good. We have four years of experience, not too much. It's not yet very stable, but it's, uh, the hypothesis is quite stable. So we need people who go along with us. We want to have investors, we want to have people investing who really want to do the learning together with us in order to be prepared for doing the big scale things. Mm. What would then be the possible things for the, for, for the woodland companies and, and things like that. But this middle is, is still missing. That's actually, so it's part of the 12.5 million hectare social forestry initiative. That's it basically from my side. Thank you very much for that. We wouldn't have allowed you to go back and burn a blanket for not sharing that with us. Uh, to go back to Liam, um, I come from the public sector. I work for the government, specifically the Department of Forestry in Malawi. And right now we are talking about developing public-private partnerships and forest concessions to allow the private sector to invest in forest landscape restoration because all along, we were like, oh, we will employ people. They will manage commercial plantations. We will employ people. They will work with communities to plant trees. But it's a huge task. Um, how do you, what, what do you see as the challenges that um, would come from such uh, initiatives so that for us to improve, to allow you to be able to invest? Because you have to plant the bamboo to provide an alternative to the firewood um, that is required for people. Um, thank you. I, I think, to be honest, to start with, the private sector needs to decide where it wants to invest. Does it want to invest in the government uh, and, and, and in very risky African countries, or does it want to invest in the private sector and, and, and large farms, uh, ranches, uh, community-run organizations where there is a degree of autonomy and, and control? And I, I think that the, from the private sector perspective, um, particularly when you're starting off, it's much better to minimize your investments, to have all your assets portable so that you can move them, and to make sure that um, you're trading in natural indigenous woodland that is already there. Nobody had to plant it. 
you know, nobody had to fertilize it, nobody had to irrigate it, and, and it didn't require any pruning. Wood fuel is, is a massive uh, industry potentially because it's hot water, it's steam, it's electricity, and you can sell it to the private sector. You don't have to sell it under a, public -private, uh, under a, a power purchase agreement to, to the government. So it gives you the autonomy, gives you the freedom, and it gives you a much greater return. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have to ask uh, one of these governments for permission to do something, it takes a long time, and it's much better always to deal with small private farms, ranches, and, and, and conservancies. Thank you very much. Um, but we're trying. You'll find better conditions now. We are trying to clear up all that. You will not, you will not be frustrated anymore. We promise you. <laughs> At this point, we've, you've heard enough from us. I think let us um, open up to you now, um, our colleagues, to ask questions to the esteemed panelists in front of you. So if there are any questions, I will take um, three in the first round. We have a hand there. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, my name is James. Instagram, 510mix. So the 510 refers to the 510 million square kilometers that we have on Earth, of which only 150 million square kilometers is land, right? So a big takeaway from this uh, conference is the mix of forestry and agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question is for Shauna. Um, you're talking about e eucalyptus. And I'm wondering, was there some due diligence done to see if there could be some sort of uh, agroforestry component to these projects? Some sort of uh, something else instead of the business as usual monoculture of eucalyptus, some integration of food or uh, other forest products? Thank you. We have another hand there. And Thanks very much. Uh, it's very encouraging to see this picture. I was wondering if any of the speakers could uh, give us a sense in qualitative terms about the relative importance of the different value streams uh, to the investors. I mean, uh, is it uh, lumber? Is it, is it food? Uh, is it carbon dioxide credits? Uh, is it uh, wood energy, uh, wood residue, something producing energy? I mean, what what are the value chains that you're considering in the calculations? Uh, let's take, there was a hand there, and um, another hand here, Dennis. So let's take those four for now. They, yeah, the lady there. Um, thanks very much. Um, this is Rosa Roman from C4. And um, this is not a personal attack to anyone, it's just um, a comment, maybe a reflection for, for the room, and I think many of us are thinking in the same direction. I think probably none of us have problems with forest investments. I think the issue here is what is an FLR and what is not, right? Mm -hmm. So we have six principles under FLR, and one has to do with restoration of ecosystem functionality, uh -huh. the other that has to do with avoiding um, the the uh, deforestation of native species, also other have to do with supporting livelihoods. And when I see some of these investments, I, I clearly, oh, I don't see a connection with FLR in the way that we want to safeguard environment and the way that we want to safeguard livelihoods. So um, for me, and this is also partly related to donors, so if there are donors in this room, is that we do need some kind of um, understanding of what is an FLR and what is not. Not because one is good and the other is bad, it's just that because it's not useful for anyone to put into the same framework things that are and that are not, right? So this was my reflection, thank you. And the last hand here, Dennis. Right, uh, Dennis Garrity, uh, World Agroforestry Center and Evergreening Alliance. Um, I'd like to uh, delve a little more with Liam uh, into the proposition that you presented about bamboo and wood fuel. And um, to ask you to give us a little bit on, a more understanding of how 
the wood fuel system would work. In other words, I think you're pr promoting bamboo for, uh, for wood fuel or bamboo products, as well as um, comifera and other acacia species that grow naturally in ranches on the savanna in the drylands for, um, for, for electrical power generation. So how do you take that value chain and move it through? In other words, you're talking about harvesting, perhaps planting more of these uh, bamboo areas, and then, uh, and then moving them through to uh, your value chain. But like my previous questioners, it's not quite clear how that will restore land and, and what, 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 how it will add um, uh, environmental services to the land. Um. Thank you very much. For, so we have three questions, and um, the other one was a comment. I think it's food for thought for everyone on what is ephemeral and what is not. As we're moving on, we need to have that really in mind, because we're talking about the same tree planting that we've been doing for years. Some of these things, I mean, almost every other intervention that we're doing to restore landscapes is not new, but we need to have it in our minds, what is it that we're talking about in terms of whether it's ephemeral or not. So there are two questions that are going, one is going to Shona, one is going to Liam. Um, let's start with Shona, but the other question was general, so I'll ask Johannes and, uh, and Alistair to delve into that, the one on value chains, uh, what the relative importance of uh, what, is, what the interventions were doing. So I'll, let's start with Shona, then Liam, then Alistair and Johannes to answer the, the general question. Thank you for your question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, very good question, and I know that uh, eucalyptus is a controversial topic when uh, you're talking about Africa. And first of all, I'll say that uh, the plan wasn't originally to, to grow any eucalyptus, it was uh, going to be pine. Uh, we currently only have about 20% uh, eucalyptus there, and what we found was that uh, there were parts of the, con the, the concession where the sites were more suitable to that species. Uh, from water soil perspective and as well there were markets that were very uh, lucrative for you for eucalyptus uh, the pole market is is expanding rapidly as Uganda is electrifying they need power poles so that's kind of one aspect of it um, the aspect of agroforestry uh, combining that into the into the plantation or into the model itself not as far as that we've invested into it directly with the investment funds that we've received. Um, kind of how we've approached that is, I mean, we have a legal obligation to establish this land with productive forest. That's kind of the, the agreement that we have with the government, and that's what the, this zoning of the land is for. However, as I mentioned, there was a large uh, population surrounding the area that had previously uh, before it was uh, allocated, even though it was zoned as for production forest, it had been used uh, occasionally and illegally for, for growing crops. So there's been a huge learning process, and as I mentioned, working with lo local farmers to uh, assist them in increasing their productivity on farm. And as well, as, as we've been kind of progressing slowly with the planting, there's been communication with these farmers, you know, so they've been growing their crops on the forest reserve and we say, okay, in, in six months, in one year time, we're gonna be, uh, gonna be planting trees here and then engaging with them on how to improve. So the food security issue is, is handled. It's not really an issue there. We've managed with the farmers we've worked with to Im improve their production by three times what they were producing previously. Um, and then as well onto that, we've also started um, a Trees on Farm program where we're working with farmers on climate smart agriculture and as well uh, native restoration and commercial tree production on their own farms. So this is kind of bringing in the food security element into it and, and working with local farmers on agroforestry. So again, keeping the commercial element uh, too focused on that because we need to make it a fi financially viable uh, opportunity, but also uh, looking at the larger landscape. And your question for FLR is, is extremely relevant, but I will 
let my colleagues answer that. And we don't, uh, we don't take that lightly. And we don't use the term kind of just as a, a marketing strategy. Liam? Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for your, your questions. I want to begin by saying that unless the African people are allowed to make money from what grows in their native environment, be it montane forest, be it savanna land, be it African woodland, they will remove it, they will destroy it, they will burn it, and they will replace it with something that does make money. And for most of those people, it is cattle and sheep. Now, only 20% of Kenya is, is, is really arable. 80% is semi-arid or desert, and that provides for a variety of woodland. In my view, we've lost 75% of our indigenous bamboo in Kenya because no value was placed on it, because it was seen as, as a, an exotic weed, a foreign weed, you know, um, in large part by the British government when they colonized Kenya, and then later by successive African governments um, after colonization ended. And we have a situation in which we desperately need to create that value, we need to create those markets, and, and the existing market shareholders in energy need to be able to use it. The government needs to come to the, to the party, and the government needs to be serious about its allocations of, 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 of concession or special use license under public-private partnership. They must take foreign investment seriously. Now, if they don't, then the private sector has to go to the farmers, the ranchers, and the conservancies, and they have to work with them. And instead of selling the, that wood fuel into to, the government as electricity, they have to sell it as hot water, steam, or electricity to private industries. Industries in, in the dairies, the breweries, uh, the, the tea industry, they all need cheap energy. And wood fuel is by far the cheapest form of portable energy in the country. So I want to encourage those, those people in the rural areas to enhance and protect their indigenous woodland. And the only way that they, they will do that is if they make real money from that woodland. Thank you very much, and let's hear from Alistair and Johannes concerning the um, value chains question. Well, I'll let Johannes answer on the business side of things, because I'm not working in business in that side of things, but I think from our point of view, particularly in answer to the question on um, looking at forest landscape restoration in its broader sense, mm -hmm. um, there's a huge opportunity to use forest landscape restoration mm -hmm. um, as a mechanism to really look at land use and land use planning. Um, when we talk about land use restoration, I don't think of restoring everything back to pristine natural habitats. There's a huge range in there. Um, there's a lot of degraded land um, that can be put to better use. And that could be for improving the soils, it could be for uh, agriculture, it could be for plantations, it could even be for restoring natural habitats. And we're losing natural habitats at such a rate, we need to find every kind of tool that we can find to try and maintain those habitats and increase them. Uh, particularly in places like we're talking about in Africa where we have um, really rapidly declining areas for wildlife. We have huge loss of wildlife, we have extinctions. So we need to try and use these tools to try and look at the land, land use, look at some planning, use restoration if we want to as a, a mechanism to try and get uh, real planning into the landscape, bring finance in, um, get better livelihoods through this restoration, through better agriculture, through potential businesses, but then also look at the natural habitats and why we can maintain and expand those. Anything to add, Johannes? Yes, so regarding the value streams, in our case, it's the selling of the locks after seven years. And we do a sequenced afforestation, 200 hectares a year. So we come back after seven years and have then this value stream. And it's short rotating crops. In our case, it's peanuts, cocoa and we try our, out other things. It's not carbon. In our case, it, it's too complicated and it's, 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 maybe it's too small for us at the moment. So these are the uh, value streams at the moment. And regarding the FLR principles, we have that, we work along them. But I can tell you, if you take that principles, then to apply it to, to such a concrete case, you have to make your own guidelines. And if I speak to C4, if I speak to somebody else, I get many different, as an entrepreneur, I get a diff, hundred different answers how to apply that principle to that one specific 4,000 hectare mosaic restoration. So we, in our case, need to transfer somehow that principles into internal guidelines. 
And then you have the conflict, it's always the conflict or the, the balance, to keep the balance between the ecological, the economic and the social things. So it's uh, extremely hard work and I do not see the one thing prepared for us. We research, we, we do a lot of things, but we have to work on the different issues by ourselves to transform it into internal guidelines. And I really invite everybody um, from the from, from a research and, and uh, um, field to get really engaged in concrete issues and learn how these principles could be applied. Um, thank you very much. We seem to have, unfortunately, we seem to have run out of time. We have to be getting out of here in the next five minutes. Um, but let's continue the discussion because I still see hands. These guys will still be around. Let's interact with them to still get a little bit more from them. Um, to just close up the discussion, we have heard from uh, the donor's perspective, the donor public sector perspective, we have heard um, about the needs of the private sector to invest in FLR. And we have also discussed the examples, the business case examples on how we can accelerate forest landscape restoration from the private sector point of view. What I would like to say in the end is that eventually we will need to find a way of coordinating the public and the private sector financing to ensure that FLR really does happen on the ground and really does benefit everybody, both the communities, the environment, and still, uh, make, still make the commercial sense out of it. Um, we need that to really make sure that we address all the issues that are there on the ground. And um, for sure, we have a challenge before us. It doesn't seem attractive at the moment. We have said that the more degraded the landscapes are, the bigger the risk that, pre that they present. But let's look at it as an opportunity. We say that in, in FLR, we, we say the degraded landscapes are an opportunity for us. So let's delve into that. It's a challenge. It's not going to be easy. Um, it's been mentioned. Governments are not providing the most I mean, the, the best environment for you to work in. But we will try to do that because from the public point of view, we cannot do it alone. And it's very clear that the private sector will have to get involved. Thank you very much, everyone, for being part of the discussion. Uh, my name is Dango Tumeo. I'm coming from Malawi and the, I'm the forest landscape restoration focal point um, from there. And I know the issues that are there before us. And if we are to restore the amount of degraded land that has been pledged by 2030, um, it needs everyone's efforts combined. Not each one of us working in isolation. We have a bigger challenge. Um, people have to eat the biggest the, the biggest problem that we have is that the same piece of land has to have trees on it at the same time produce enough food just for people to eat, not even sell excess, but food to eat every day. So you're looking at people that have needs for today, not tomorrow's needs. We're not trying to address tomorrow's needs, but today's needs because I have to eat. My children have to be warm. What do I do? Do I make charcoal as a way of making money? But if we engage the, pub, the private sector to invest, create jobs, um, ensure that there are tangible benefits for communities from forest landscape restoration, then we should be able to achieve the goals that we've set up. Thank you very much. <laughs>